hello and welcome to the August 30th, 2020 online sermon from Christian Fellowship Church. I'm Pastor Michael Matisic, and once again, blessed to be coming into your homes via the YouTube. And this is the end of August, August 30th, and the summer has flown by. School is back. Many of the kids are e-learning. Many of the kids are in school. Continue to pray for those children. We're going to be kicking off our WANA program here in about a week and a half. Hopefully, many children will be able to come and feel comfortable in the environment that we provide. If you're a regular attender of Christian Fellowship Church and you've not been back to church yet, know that we miss you. We're praying for you. We hope that you'll be soon considering coming back. Whatever is keeping you, if it's a health concern, we hope that can be resolved. And if it's fear, I am praying for you as well that that could be overcome. But we hope to see you back in the fellowship soon. If you're a visitor and you're checking out our church, we sure would hope that we would see you in person one day. But otherwise, continue to watch these videos, and I hope that they are a blessing to you. We have sent out sermon notes to those who regularly attend CFC, and so hopefully you can pull those out. And at this time, open your Bibles to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. That's where we're going to start today. We're continuing to look at the subject matter regarding end times, and specifically, we are looking at how close are we to the rapture, the event where Jesus Christ comes back for his church and meets them in the air and takes them back to the Father's house. And as I've stated, I hope that you are finding this subject matter very interesting, very challenging, but also something that is causing you to prepare for the return of Jesus Christ. You can say that it's been 2,000 years since Jesus Christ has come and died and paid the penalty for sins and he rose again and then promised to be coming back. You say, well, it's been 2,000 years. Is it ever really going to happen? Well, yes, it is. And it may seem like it didn't happen yesterday or last month or last year or last decade, last century, but it is something that God wants us to have in our mindset, a readiness that it can happen at any time. I guess you can say one of the reasons he hasn't come back, and we know this from the scriptures, is that he's giving time that people can get saved, that they would turn to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they would believe in Jesus Christ. And so that is the message we as a church are constantly trying to share, letting people know that the problems in this world are not because of just behavioral problems, poor education, what kind of family you grew up, but it is because of sin. We are all born in the sin, as David teaches from the Psalms, and the problem with sin is that it cannot be easily fixed. It is something that is significant. It is something that impacts the way you think, the way you speak, the way you act, and your omissions, the things that you are supposed to do but you don't do. Sin is explicitly denying what God wants us to do whether it be lying, stealing, um, sexual areas, <clears throat> excuse me, we are not to violate what God's standards are. God's standards are righteous, and that's why we call God a righteous God. He is a righteous God. And the penalty for one sin is death. None of us could pay that. It is a penalty that is going to be incurred with everyone physically, but spiritually as well, for the Bible says there is a place called the second death. Jesus Christ came to earth and paid the physical as well as the spiritual penalty for people that um, would, um, um, would believe in him. I mean, I believe he made the penalty payment for everyone, <coughs> but it's only accredited to those who place their faith in Jesus Christ. And so today we are telling people all around the world, especially in Northwest Indiana, you need to turn and leave your sin, leave the control of your life where you're the one who determines what's right and wrong, and start to turn to Jesus Christ. And when you come to him in faith, it's an admittance that you are wrong, that you are someone that has been in control of your life. And you're repenting. That's why, whether it's John the Baptist, Jesus himself, or the Apostle Paul, the message of the gospel is to repent. It's to turn. It's a turning, a change of heart, change of mind, change of direction. 
And specifically with the good news of Jesus Christ is that you are saying, I recognize that I have a penalty that I owe. Only Jesus could pay it. He was unique. He is God and he is man. And I believe he died to pay the penalty for my sins. And I am turning from my sin to give him control of my life. And you're confessing him as Lord. And belief is not just mere agreement. It is a commitment. And you believe that he died. You believe that he rose again. And when you believe this, you do it by faith alone. And you come to a realization that Jesus Christ is going to come into your life and change you. The Bible calls it being born again. And for everyone that's been born again, you know that you have this new change, this new direction. And one of the things that you are doing is expecting Jesus Christ now to return again. Because you're living for him. And so that's what we've been talking about. We want to live with that expectation that Jesus Christ is going to come about. It's a great expectation. You know, there's a book by Charles Dickens called Great Expectations. A guy read it one time and was asked, hey, what'd you think of that book? And the guy said, oh, it was okay. I guess that's kind of a joke. You know, it's a book about great expectations. We don't want you to just say the return of Jesus Christ is ho-hum. It's just okay. It is a great expectation. And I don't want you to be let down with what is happening in the sense that it isn't occurring yet. We have to have the expectation. You want to have an expectation that the return of Jesus Christ is really good. Um, just like my jokes, you expect them to be good, right? And I stress, expect them to be good. And when there aren't, you get disappointed. And I got this joke, did you hear about the pastor who had trouble telling jokes? Yeah, there was a pastor who had trouble telling jokes. Seems like he had the very same trouble in his first job when he was a postman. Yeah, he couldn't meet his boss's expectation at the post office. And so he got fired. And what was the problem? Well, I guess he had a delivery problem. Ta-da, da He couldn't deliver the mail on time. Ta-da, da So now he can't deliver jokes on time. All right. Listen. I want you to expect the return of Jesus Christ. I want believers to be looking forward to it. And when we come to this passage here in 2 Timothy, we're coming to a passage that helps remind us that we should have such a great expectation. The Apostle Paul is coming to the end of his life. We believe it's around 65 to 67 AD. He's in prison. We believe the evil Nero, the Roman Emperor, is going to kill Paul as a demonstration of, of judgment upon the Christians for, for um, the fire that Nero started in Rome, and they, he's blamed the Christians. And the Apostle Paul writes this, verse 6, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have, what? Loved his appearing. You should underline that word, loved his appearing. And that's the challenge I have as we start and we begin talking about the rapture of Jesus Christ and are we near? Because at the heart of it is I want you to have the heart that you love Jesus Christ and expect him to return and you look forward to it. And if I were to ask you, what are the things that you love? What are the things that you look forward to? You could give a whole bunch of things. Well, I look forward to eating out. I look forward to maybe a party tonight. But big picture, I look forward to being married. I look forward to having kids. I, watch, I, I look forward to watching my kids grow up. I look forward to my kids getting married. I look forward to grandkids. I look forward to a vacation. I look forward to a career. I look forward to a, a business that I can just hand over to my kids. There's all these things I look forward to and I love. And I want to do these things in life. But God is saying, I want the number one priority in your life, I believe, to be the return of Jesus Christ. And when you have that expectation, it impacts the way you live. And I said this a couple weeks ago, and I want to reiterate it. I talk about this subject matter regarding loving the return of Jesus Christ. And it's often people that are in their teens or their early 20s that come back and say, boy, I just hope that Jesus doesn't return for a while so that I can get married, so I can have children, so I can do this, or I can do that. 
But if you talk to people in their 40s and their 50s where they've already been beaten up in life, I find that it's almost without exception that people are saying, boy, I am so ready for Jesus Christ to return. And I want to tell you, those of you that are in your teens and your 20s, think about that. You know, think about what is going to happen in the next 20 years to you. Life is going to come down. It's going to come hard. And I would hope that you're the exception from the standpoint that life wouldn't be so bitter. But the reality of it is, is life is cruel because we live in a sin-cursed world. Again, why we need to get the gospel out? Because it is a cursed world. And so my hope is that when you look at a passage like this, I don't know exactly what the reward is, but there is a reward, how it's going to be played out for those who love the return of Jesus Christ. But it obviously is people who have acted in a prepared way, have served God with a mentality that they know that they're looking forward to when Jesus Christ returns. They're not storing their treasure up on this earth. They're storing it up in heaven. So my challenge is to you, look at this. Think about, do you really love the return of Jesus Christ? Don't be like, oh, I'm okay if Jesus returns. I want you to be passionate about it. Again, love is a strong word. It's a love of action that includes a passion. And we want you to have a passion for Jesus Christ. So just as a recap over the past two um, videos that we have put up, is that we have started looking at how near is the rapture. And we've gone through six reasons why so far. And those are on the sermon notes, and let me just recap them. Again, we're doing a topical study, but we're always trying to look at things verse by verse as we go through it. But we've talked about the fact that we are seeing end times come together, just like Daniel 12. We talked about the fact that Israel is already regathered in the land. And I point out that all of these things are things that are going to happen in the tribulation, but we're seeing seeds of them now. And that's what gets us so excited. So we're seeing people all of a sudden comprehend more and more of end times. We're seeing Israel back in the land. We're seeing Israel's ready to rebuild the temple. That temple isn't built yet, but I tell you, go back, watch that podcast, uh, or listen to the podcast, or watch the YouTube video on more of those details. But that temple is ready to be rebuilt. It is necessary in the tribulation to have a temple. We are seeing the, the rise of the rebirth of the Roman Empire. We are constantly seeing a Western peacemaker between the Jews and Arabs. And we are seeing the rise of the countries of Magog. Six strong reasons. One of those alone could get you excited. Six of them are pretty intense, but we're going to add more. We're going to add a lot more over the next few weeks. Number seven right now. If you have your sermon notes, fill it in the blank with the word apostasy. We are seeing the apostasy of the church start. If you'll turn to 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians at this time. We're going to look at a passage that we looked at a couple weeks ago as our first passage for this reason. And what this, what this reason is all about is that I believe the scriptures teach that in the tribulation, the people who associate with God are going to depart from doctrine. They are going to depart from the faith. That's what the idea of apostasy is. It's a departing from the faith. It's a departure. All right? And in this passage, this is one of a few passages that indicate that's exactly what happens. And so that's what I want to work through. My point is, is that when we look at the tribulation and God describes the fact that there's a departure of the faith from doctrine, that we are already seeing mass seeds of it like church history has never seen before. And, and so let's go into it. First, understand passages that clearly show this, and then we will go into current events. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, what we see is the Apostle Paul is writing to a church that's undergoing persecution, and they've been lied to. They have been told that they're in the day of the Lord. They're in the tribulation. And so Paul says in verse 1, Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter from us to the fact that the day of the Lord has come, that the day of the Lord is here, 
Remember, it's very clear that you understand. He's saying, don't think that it is here. Let no one in any way deceive you, trick you, for it is not here, not will come. Some of your Bibles have in italics the future tense, will come, but it should just be the, you know, the continuation of what was the verb in, in verse 2. It is not here unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. There's our key concept, the apostasy. That has to come first. Now, this isn't a precursor. This isn't like the apostasy has to come first, then the day of the Lord comes, then the rapture comes. What this is saying is that you're not in the day of the Lord because the very first thing that happens in the day of the Lord, one of the first things you see is that the church goes apostate. Then the man of lawlessness is revealed. Let me illustrate this because sometimes it's a difficult concept. We start our church service, when we begin our church service, typically it begins with announcements and then we go into like a video challenge. So if I were to say to you, our church service has not started unless the announcements come first and then the church video. That is in essence describing what is within the service. I believe that's what the Apostle Paul is doing here. And um, Dr. Thomas was very clear on this when I went through seminary with him, that this is how you're to take this grammar. These aren't precursors. And the key here, though, is the idea of an apostasy. I believe, again, within the tribulation of falling away. And I think this fits with other, with other passages, like turn over in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, and in Matthew chapter 24, the famous passage where Jesus Christ is talking about, I believe, the tribulation, he's talking about the beginning part, the birth pangs that many of us believe are the, the, the similar to the sealed judgments. When you come to verse 8, he says, all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs, and I know that some people think this is descriptive of the time period now. Um, but I know that at least when you come to verse 9, it's, cl it's clearly to me within the tribulation. And he says this, then they will deliver you to what? Tribulation and will kill you and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, verse 10 says, at that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Well, what are, what's he talking about? Many will fall away. Many will fall away from having an allegiance to God and they'll hate one another. I believe that is the apostasy, the apostasy. And you say, well, wait a second, if the church has been raptured, who's there to go apostate? And that's my exact point. We've already seen in the Bible that there are churches that are filled with unbelievers. Where, like for example, in Revelation chapter 3, the church of Laodicea. It is the church that's neither hot nor cold. And basically, Jesus challenges them to get saved. And it, it, sit back and think about that. You're neither hot or cold. Why? Because you're not saved. You're, he wants you to be, to be saved. The church of Laodicea was a church filled with unbelievers. I think what's going to happen is the church is going to be raptured. And, and when the church is raptured, what is going to happen is that there's going to be many churches that are filled with unbelievers and they are going to be left behind. And this fits with the description of how the last days are. That the last days are going to have an infiltration of churches with people with unbelievers in them. I just cite, you know... 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 3 talks about the false doctrine regarding food and marriage will be seen during the entire church age, which he calls the last days. And just turn over to one other passage and you see this. This is the, more of the famous passage, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, where a, a very famous quote from Paul goes out as a warning and Paul says this, before he tells people that he's being poured out as a drink offering. Verse 1, chapter 3, realize this, 
that in the last days, difficult times will come. Now, I believe these last days are descriptive of the entire church age, but most commentators agree that it becomes magnified, this description, as we get closer to the end. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious, gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now, here's the star verse, verse 5. Holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. You say, wait a second. What do you mean, holding to a form of godliness? These are people that are claiming to be followers of God, followers of Jesus, but they have basically departed from the faith. They have departed from the, the doctrine. And I believe as we get closer and closer to the end time, this description is getting us ready for what will happen in the tribulation. So I believe what's going to happen is we're going to see the church of Jesus Christ be raptured but it's going to be few and far between the number that are taken. And where the preparation for this is coming for the great deception for the world is that in the past 50 years, in America and around the world, there has been an explosion for the megachurch. The megachurch is where you've got 1,000 or 10,000 people or 20,000 people at a church. And even though in church history... The majority of churches, and still are, most churches are under 100 people. Believe it or not, we're a small church, but we're even bigger than the average church because we'll have average around 130, 140 people at our church. The average church is less than 100. And what happened, what's, gonna ha what's happening, though, is that there's this great focus that if you are a significant church, you've got... 1,000, 3,000, 10,000 people. And this really began in the 1970s when mega churches started going all over the place. And it started with Bible churches. MacArthur's church started, Indian Hills Community Church started, other Bible churches kicked off. But eventually what happened was that, that, that others wanted to grow like them. And so what you saw was the Robert Schuller movement, the Rick Warren Saddleback movement, and you have saw the health, wealth, and prosperity movement, to name a few. And you started to see these mega churches grow all over the place. And what happened was they grew with church principles of growth that had nothing to do with giving people the gospel. And let me just give you one great example, the Willow Creek Church methodology. And I've mentioned this to you before, but it's, a, it's something that just needs to be reiterated because... It has become not only a church movement, it is not only something that churches copy, it is now a denomination. And so back in the 1980s, a pastor named Bill Hybels decided that his church wasn't growing. He was trying to reach people with the gospel, it wasn't going anywhere, and so he came up with the idea, hey, let's have church in this theater, let's, let's not ask people to bring their Bibles, let's not talk about sin, let's have talks where we talk about you know, things that matter to people, like their family, or their marriages, or their careers, and how to deal with stress. But we're not going to have any of this doctrine stuff, because that makes people feel uncomfortable, and especially if you talk about sin. Now, occasionally they would talk about sin, and occasionally they, were, they would deal with, you know, Jesus, and they'd talk to people about Jesus. But I've got a book in my office that did an evaluation of these back in the 1990s. And that book said, at the time, they had 20,000 people attending, and it said that if we did an evaluation of Willow Creek, and 80% of the people who attend there were not converted. They didn't believe the gospel. And, and when Bill Hybels and the church were challenged about it, they didn't care because they were just happy people were coming and hoping that by maybe osmosis, these people would eventually maybe go to a Wednesday Bible study and they would get saved. Well, the problem is, is now this has become a denomination, and it's spread throughout America. And, and, and the challenge was, hey, Bill, you're not preaching the Bible. And eventually, in like, oh, the mid-2000s, Willow Creek issued a statement. They apologized. Hey, we realize we're not growing disciples, and we've not been using the Bible, and we kind of repent of it. But they, they didn't change. 
and, and, and they still continue to have their church grow and have other churches grow, no matter what your denomination is, no matter what your theological background is, they would sell their principles because it was more about how to grow irregardless of doctrine. Again, that's what apostasy is. You've left the old doctrine. Remember, we use this line here, and I used this a lot when I first got here at Christian Fellowship Church. What you win people with is what you win them to. If I win people with Jesus Christ, they're committed to Jesus Christ. But if I'm this winsome pastor that, that tells stories, tells jokes, that, that that's my main purpose, and I never really point people to the cross, then all of a sudden, that's why people are coming. And they're not committed to Jesus. And I use that because you can tell a joke, you can tell a story, but you have to eventually bring it back to the cross. You have to bring it to Jesus. And there were warnings. And I, I, 20 years ago, I said, Bill Hybels in this book is described as a liar. What do you mean a liar? Well, he would tell stories that were fantastic and they were enthralling and people would get, get really enraptured in them, as the book talked about. But they were personal stories where he would talk about how he survived the six-car pileup. And I believe that's the one illustration in the book. And then when the investigators who were writing the book went in and this found out what the actual events is, it, it wasn't a six-car pileup. It was just a small little fender bender. But Bill had to make it something that was a great story. And he felt he was totally justified in doing that so that it would pull people in. Well, listen, when you become someone who continually lies and presents things that are true, then you begin, I think, sometimes to believe the lies. And, and sure enough, what has happened in the past few years, Bill Hybels had to resign because of, of sexual immorality. And that's public. That's a public thing. And, and sadly, because, because the church isn't rooted in doctrine, who took over? A woman pastor. And a woman pastor who would violate 1 Timothy 3, that a woman isn't to be a pastor. And, and we recently had a, a mega church in our area invite our singles group to be a part of one of their singles events where a Willow Creek woman pastor was coming. And when I said, wait a second, we can't send our, our singles out to this type of event. We believe 1 Timothy 3. How are you going to answer this? They wouldn't answer me back. And, and that's the idea, is doctrine doesn't matter. It's just the fact that we got this good speaker and, they, and, and that's how they advertise it. Great speaker, win some stories, come and learn um, stuff about God from this, and I believe, false teacher. And wh what we have seen is the idea of doctrine is offensive. I watch people on Facebook post things that are from good solid Bible churches because they're frustrated like me that you try to post things about doctrine and doctrine is downplayed as if you're a funding, uh, a fighting funding. And like my one friend said, those who come up with the terms win the war. And you know, fighting funding sounds like you're this mad, crazed, screaming, raving lunatic. <laughs> when in actuality, all you're trying to do is try to preach the Bible. I mean, and, and we're watching it, whether it's Christian music, Christian entertainment, there, there's a um, continual just departure from doctrine where things are not tied to the gospel of faith alone and Christ alone, who's God and man who died and paid the penalty for your sins, or just telling truths. Like I watch Christian, so-called Christian movies. Um, I can only imagine that was the movie. I recently watched that. And I was enthralled. I thought, what a great story. It had me crying. So I watched this movie, and then I do a little Google search of, of the history of the actual events, and I find out the movie's basically a lie. And people don't even think anything of it. You're claiming to be a Christian movie, and yet you present a lie? And this goes on and on. And you go into a Christian bookstore, and when you go into the Christian bookstores, they're not filled with doctrine. They're filled with stories. And, 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 you know, the health, wealth, and prosperity or, or doctrinal books on prayer that are totally false. Remember about 20 years ago, a book came out called um, The Prayer of Jabez. And it was a book on how to pray. And I read it and others that know, that know doctrine read it. 
at Reddit, and, and you come out, and this book is an incredible twisting of scriptures. Nobody should read that book. It is, you should run if somebody gives you that book. And, and, and yet, when you, and I went out and I said, hey, you should be reading this book, there were people who were saying, how dare you be so negative? It's good, it's getting people to pray. Well, if you're teaching people a lie, why would you want people to pray that way? And no different than there was a book called The Harburger. And it, was, it went mass amongst Christians. It was all about how the Twin Towers were predicted in the book of Isaiah, chapter 11. And I read that, and I, once again, came back to the people who gave it to me and said, this, is, this book's a lie. And yet, I just recently saw that author uh, has been noted as very prominent today in Christian circles. My point is, is that we're living in a day and age when the church in mass is filled with churches and people who profess to be Christians who want nothing to do with doctrine. And, and that's what apostasy is. You've departed from doctrine. And so this is what I think will happen. You've got churches like ours that I believe the people who come here have heard the gospel. And if you're here it's, and you're a regular attender, it's because you want to, 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 to follow through with the idea of faith alone and Christ alone. You believe in this gospel. You are born again and you want to study God's word and you want to know what God says. But if the rapture occurs and our church disappears and there's only like 100 of us here, 140 of us, and we all disappear, it's nothing compared to the church down the street with 3,000 or 2,000 people or 10,000 people. And if most of those people aren't believers, when the rapture occurs, what's going to happen? People are going to say, well, nothing significant happened to the church because we're still here. And, 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 and that's what I think is going to happen. That's why I think when, the, when it finally occurs, there's going to be a quick shift where those churches will give their allegiance to the Antichrist. They'll give their allegiance to other false doctrine because they're already there. But it's only in name that they call themselves Christian now. So I think the, when the Apostle Paul talks about the apostasy will happen first, the Holy Spirit will be taken away from the, with the church the true church, and these people will now be given over. What the point is, is that we are seeing in mass, we are seeing in mass the church get ready for the apostasy. And I just wanted you to be ready for that and be aware of it. Now, quickly, let me just go over the next two because these aren't really, these aren't really going to be in depth. If you'll go over to Revelation chapter 6. So not only are we seeing the apostasy of the church start? But now I want you to fill in the blank with the word mass. We now have weapons of mass destruction. And what do I mean by this, mass destruction? We have weapons that will kill a good portion of the world. And if you're in Revelation chapter 6, verse 8, the sealed judgments, you look at verse 8, and John writes, I looked and behold an ashen horse, and he who sat on it had the name death, and Hades was following him, and authority was given to him over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. One fourth of the world dies. Bam. Okay, and then you go over to Revelation 9.18. And 9.18 says, a third of the mankind was killed by these three plagues. These are now the trumpet judgments. So now a third of the world is killed. A third of, I believe, of the people that are left. Well, I'm not going to have you turn there, but Jesus says in Matthew 24, 22, that if he doesn't return by the end, everyone would have died. So how many are actually dead has to be extremely high. Now, obviously, whether you have a sword or you have a knife, you, know, you have a little gun, you can kill lots of people. But we're living in a day and age when you can see the ability to quickly kill mass numbers exists ever since World War II. Ever since World War II, that when we've had the development of the atomic bomb, we've built upon that. We have these incredible missiles that can go all over the world. And it's been reported like 10, 20, 30, 40 times over that the atomic bombs, the nuclear bombs that are on this world can wipe out the world those 20, 30, 40 times over. And all depending upon which source you listen to and are aware of, depends upon how many times everyone on the earth can be killed. Well, 
<laughs> these numbers are incredible. One third of the world, one fourth of the world, almost everyone. And I didn't even get to the Zechariah, the Zechariah 13, 8 passage that says two thirds of every Jew in the tribulation will die. Two thirds. So if there's 20 million Jews today, um, two thirds, about 13, 14 million will be killed in the tribulation. That's mass killing. In a very short amount of time, the seven years of the tribulation. And so I just think, yes, it's been around since World War II and more, okay, and it's been existing, but we just have to remember when John wrote this, these weapons didn't exist. And somebody could read the book of, uh, of Revelation and say, how in the world is that many people in the world going to be killed in such a short amount of time? Well, now we know how. Now we've seen it. And it's here and it's been here. That just tells me we are close, okay? And then lastly, if you're in Revelation, go over to Revelation 11 and fill in the blank. We now have the ability for worldwide viewing, worldwide viewing. The next point has to do with the world viewing on television through satellite the events in Jerusalem. Um, in this text, there is a scene in which two Prophets that God has put active in the tribulation are irritating the world. And when they are preaching, they're irritating the world, and the world wants them dead, but God won't allow them to be killed until they are finally killed almost at the end. Let, let me pick up in verse 1. Then there was given me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, Get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations, and they will tread under the foot the holy city for 42 months. We believe that's the second half of the tribulation. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. Who these two witnesses are, we don't know. It's been proposed that it's Enoch, who did not die in the Old Testament, or Elijah, who did not die. Or Moses, who we learned that Satan fought over his body. Did God allow him to come back? Or is it two unknown people? We'll know it when it happens, okay? But for now, I'm just saying we don't know, but they are clearly two witnesses. And my two witnesses, and they'll prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. 1260 days is three and a half years, half the tribulation. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. These have the power to shut up the sky so that rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. Now, again, this has never occurred before. How in the world could... People think that this is figurative or this is only some type of metaphor in the sense of um, something that has happened in the past or, you know, and, and it's happening on a spiritual level. This is physical and it's going to happen. It's a future event. Verse 7, when they have finished their testimony, the beast, which we believe is the Antichrist, that comes out of the abyss, will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Well, that's Jerusalem. Those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. Now, the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations are going to look at them. How are they going to look at them? Now, is it just people that are in that area and there's representatives from all over the place? It could be that. But it's more likely that the world is watching. And obviously, ever since the advent of television, where people can watch things around the world, this is now in place. You add on the fact that we have satellite TV, and it, makes, it becomes all the more real. And, and, and now we have these cell phones, and I've been in the middle of, of Siberia, and I've been able to watch TV on my phone in the middle of the ton frozen tundra. And I realized it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you could be in the heart of the jungle of Africa, where I was, or you could be where I was privileged to be in the frozen tundra of Siberia. And you can watch, you can watch TV. And that's my point, is now we now have this ability. And I believe that 
This is just a reminder of how close we are. That the ability to watch these people, these two prophets that are dead, and you look at verse 10, and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate, and they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. But after three and a half days, the breath of life came into them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. Okay? And, and, and so I believe the world is going to watch it, and it's going to be a testimony that God is going to send to the world because there's a worldwide tribulation. So listen, people. This is one of the things I just think you need to be aware of. Obviously, John writes this in 95 AD. Someone would have to laugh and say, how are the people in China going to see this, John? How are the people in America going to see this? How is this going to happen over, over a very short number of days that people are going to be cognizant of this? Well, guess what? We now have the ability to watch this. And, and it's been in place. I'm not saying it just happened overnight, but it's something that's been in place and something we all need to be aware of. So I'm challenging you, please wake up and realize the time is near. End time events are coming together and we're seeing it. Daniel 12, Israel's gathered in the land. Israel's ready to rebuild the temple. We're seeing the rise of the rebirth of the Roman Empire. We're seeing the Western peacemaker um, continually be there between the Jews and the Arabs. And we are seeing the countries of Magog alive and active in hating Israel. And now we're seeing the apostasy of the church start. We're seeing that weapons of mass destruction have been and are now all around us. And we have the ability for worldwide viewing. When we started this talk, I talked about expectations. You know when you expect your favorite meal, how wonderful it is when that delivers. You anticipate the test, taste and then you bite into it. And guess what? It tastes great. I got to tell you, studying the end times is not like that. It's not like that for me. I think when you study end times, there's great expectation on how fun it's going to be and how it's interesting to learn the future. But I'm like John in Revelation 10, if you remember back from our previous study there, where he eats the words and they make him sick. The, these greatly depress me because I look at the fact that what's happening in our world is that we are drawing nearer and we're getting closer. And there's the reality that the majority of the people that we know are going to go through the tribulation if we're raptured tonight. And the reality of it is those people, the majority of the people are going to die. One third, or excuse me, one fourth, one third of then almost all the people are killed in the tribulation. Every, almost every Jew you know is going to die in the tribulation. And so my fear is because the majority of people are people that I know or unbelievers, they will die in their sins. They could have escaped judgment, as Jesus said, but men love darkness rather than light. So today I'd say to you, if you're someone that's never turned to Jesus Christ, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I say, turn to the light. Jesus says to unbelievers, where I am going, you cannot come. You are from below, I am from above. You are the world, I am not of this world. I said therefore to you that you shall die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am, meaning that he is God, you shall die in your sins. If you abide in my word, he goes on to say, then you are truly my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Free from sin, free from judgment. If anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Look at your life. Are you someone that keeps his word? Make sure that you believe, and make sure those around you believe. Because my expectation is this, time is running out. We're getting closer, people, every day. Amen.